Hey, thanks for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take on different visual storytelling topics. We think hard about this stuff so that you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and a teaching artist. The other host is... Hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger, a user experience and game designer. Um, and well, we have a special guest today to help us on this uh, topic of animation. Um, we have we have a, a third host who yeah. is... Uh, so we've got cartooning, we've got game design. Let's take it up a notch, as they say, and we'll talk about animating. Uh, we got Hannah O'Neill here. Hey, Hannah. Hello. Nice to meet you guys. Hannah yeah, O'Neill, who is a illustrator and animator. Is that the, the title you go by? Yes. Yeah. Illustrator, <laughs> animator, um, general nerd. Cartoonist. You also make comic books. Uh, yes, you debuted one at yes. A2CAF last year. Um, yeah. And we can see your work at Cyrilda.com. S-E-R-I-L-D-A. Do you yes, want to tell us the, the origin of Cyrilda? Yeah. Oh, yes. I was going to say, that is my middle name. My middle name is Cyrilda. Um, and that is a family name passed down through the women in my family from my mother's side. And uh, so the story goes that my great grandmother may uh was named Cyrilda and she um had made my mother promise to name her daughter Cyrilda because there was a generational gap where everyone hated the name for some reason and so no one was named Cyrilda and so my great grandmother was like oh, no the name can't die and so my mother named me Cyrilda Later, I learned in college, I looked it up to try to figure out what Cyrilda meant because it was like a weird name. And I had always kind of avoided it because it was weird. And it ends up, it turns out that Cyrilda is a German name for a like armored warrior woman. So, oh, perfect. Wow. From that day on, <laughs> I was like, this is going to be my internet name because <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, is it okay if is it okay if I uh, play some of the some of the animation that you've done that's on your uh, website? Yeah, yeah, go right ahead. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share real quick and pull up the clums, and we will hear it and see it live on the screen. Fablevision presents the clums by Nishama Ryman, created with her friends at Fablevision. It was a very important night. Grace was hard at work, setting the table for her dad's birthday. There, in front of her, was a bottle of purple beet sauce, which suddenly wiggled. It waddled, and then it went flying, splattering the most intense beetish spew across the most perfectly clean white tablecloth. Uh-oh. Grace, her mother shouted, but but it wasn't me, implored Grace. Her mother took a deep breath and managed to say, well, if it wasn't you, then who was it? Grace drew a blank. Then, to her surprise, her mother calmly said, I'll be right back. While her mother sauntered off, Grace noticed a commotion on the table. Behind an empty bottle of beet sauce appeared one, two, Three, four little creatures. Who are you? asked Grace. We? Us? We, dear, are the clumses, said the little creatures. As in clumsy. As in cluts. Well, that suits you perfectly. You are a bunch of little clumses. You guys are making quite a terrible mess. The oldest clums said, Dear Grace, Take a moment to see things differently. We clumses don't see terrible messes. We see splats, puddles, and smears with open eyes, heart, and mind. We feel they are actually quite beautiful. Grace paused and began to look at the big purple stain in a whole new way. It really is so beautiful. Breathtakingly original. Gorgeously unique. All four clumses sighed in unison. Ah, a masterpiece! Grace's mother came back, 
carrying a whole box of art supplies. To Grace's surprise, her mother said, Another wonderful design, Clumses. But it could use just a bit more pizzazz. Grace was unable to form words. Instead, she took the brush, dipped it in the beet sauce, and gave it a big swirly whirl. She smiled. Grace, her mother, and the four clumses splashed, swirled, splattered, and sloshed with glee. The tablecloth was now ready. What had begun as a wonderful evening became an extraordinary one. A feast, a family, and a magnificent tablecloth. The end. Ah! <laughs> okay, so... Let's talk about this a little bit. <laughs> and, uh... Oh. Yes. Uh, those designs of the little creatures is, are, are so great. Uh... I don't know how much you had to do with those designs, but uh, the way they look and the way they move, super cute. Yeah, um, but I, I, I didn't have a lot to do with the designs. Um, as an animator, typically what happens is uh, somebody else designs it and then I make it move. So that leads me to say that, that this is uh, a workshop you led at the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival last summer. And uh, to a packed house, uh, that was like the most highly attended event at that venue where you were at the Ann Arbor Arts Center. Um, and so I was wondering if, it, you know, it's been on my mind for a long time. It's like, oh, I'd love to get Hannah on the show to, to sort of talk through a few of the things she did in that or covered in that workshop. Not the whole thing, obviously, because I think you did like an mm -hmm. hour. And that would be this whole <laughs> show. And we got a lot of things to cover. But I wonder yeah. if we could, it's, is it time to start the, the first section, Rob? What do you think? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, as I just want to, yeah, let's hear, let's hear Hannah's thoughts about, um, you know, that the, like, yeah, the, the animation and, uh, you know, I want, I just want to pick her brain. I'm excited about the, uh, um, aspects related to, um, like video gaming and whatnot as well. So I, yeah, let's, let's go on the ground. Uh, oh, is it time to go on the ground? Well, I, I gotta play the bridge music. All right, yeah. here we go. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Another day walking in circles, haunted by memories. I push on this wheel. I pray to Kram, grant me revenge, and help me to answer the riddle of steel. Yes. So, yes, the bridge music this week is specifically chosen for Hannah. That is from <laughs> Co Conan the Musical. <laughs> Have you seen yeah, this, so Rob? Like, I haven't seen <laughs> I'm it. I'm a huge Conan fan, so. Uh, <laughs> so that's why that's why I like Conan the musical, obviously. <laughs> it's it's a retelling of Conan the Barbarian, but just like with this guy singing in this impersonation of Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean impersonations of Arnold Schwarzenegger are funny enough, so having them having someone sing it in a musical is even better. <laughs> and and it'd be like plot accurate to the, <laughs> yeah. the movie. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you can find it on YouTube. We'll link to it in the show notes. But anyway, yeah, that. that sounds awesome. Uh, so Hannah, I wonder if you could uh, walk us through a little bit. Like, so you led a, a workshop on animating in Photoshop. In Photoshop. Yes. So we've, we've just shown that you you work for Fable Vision Studios and you do Ooh. this animating stuff all the time. Um, I wonder if you could uh, show us a, a, like a few ideas that you covered in that uh, event. Sure. Sure. Um. So. Uh, approaching Photoshop as an animation tool isn't um, typically what comes to mind <laughs> when one thinks of Photoshop, but actually Photoshop has a lot of um, animation potential. Uh, and I can go ahead and share my screen with you, right? Uh, so you yeah. can see what, what I'm sort of talking about. Um, and Clip Studio Paint recently introduced a animation pane within it, um, which I I think they were promoting it as like, oh, you can make animated gifs, um, which is neat. <laughs> but yeah. I, I I haven't seen I haven't I haven't looked to see what people have been doing with that. So I'm interested in watching the, uh, some of your ideas on this to think about how I might 
employ them in Clip Studio Paint. But okay, so we have we have screen sharing. Here yes. we go. So um, usually when you open up, um, or thing. so usually when you open up Photoshop, you're not going to have you're going to have this screen. Um, and so if you just open up the timeline window, this guy pops up. Um, and typically there are, there are two different ways to use the timeline, but I prefer the uh, video layer timeline, which is this guy here with the little bar on the layer. Anybody who's used like video edit or uh, yeah, video or audio editing software, this looks very familiar where it's like yeah. uh, on the bottom of the screen, I'm describing this for the audio listeners. Yeah. Uh, it's the regular Photoshop interface, but then underneath is like, like your layer palette. It looks just like your layer palette, except it's the width of the whole screen. And instead of having a single preview image in that layer palette, it's this stretchable sort of timeline indicating like, well, this is one second, two seconds, three seconds. And the more seconds you have, the wider the image is. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so you can trim it to whatever time you want something to be. I'm just going to like set this to two seconds. And yeah, you can take any of your uh, favorite brushes and just go for it. Um, so that's kind of, uh, th that's one of the pros to using Photoshop for animation is that you have all these amazing brushes that you can use to draw with in Photoshop to animate with, which is even better. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do is start to set up a, a frame and so just like you were talking about Jersey, you just kind of narrow down the time that you want. So let's say this one's gonna be like three frames and I'll draw an eyeball. And okay. then I'm gonna duplicate this layer. And I, I duplicate rather than create a new one just so that I can keep this same time width if you just make a new layer it makes this big long thing oh i see every time you add a layer in your layer palette it's adding a layer to your timeline as well oh, yeah it so basically the layers are your frames so um i'm being very bad and not naming my layers but usually <laughs> i would <laughs> name the frames uh i for see like frame one or frame five or what have you and so in this frame i'm just going to delete this quick quickly and then um so <laughs> onion skinning is something that a lot of animation programs have that photoshop doesn't on its own or it does but it's kind of hard to get to so what okay. i end up doing rather than using photoshop's onion skinning is um i will actually go to the frame below and make it a little uh, less opaque and then on top, I'll just on my new keyframe of the eye shut like that. And then we have something like this. Cool. I see. Yeah. I see. So so you can you can do uh, onion skinning, which is where you make the previous frame slightly less opaque so you can draw over top of it more easily and see the changes, how the changes will be applied to the, the image. Yes. Um just by changing the opacity of your layer, which should be very intuitive to somebody who's used Photoshop for a long time. <laughs> yeah, um, there are third party pl plugins that you can, or extensions that you can use to uh, help you accomplish a lot of these things, like making new frames and duplicating frames and having onion skinning. Um, Photoshop has onion skinning here and you can just apply that and you can see how it works in this way. Um, it's a little, uh harder to control so i that's why i end up doing it manually but you can you know there's a lot of different ways to do things and that's this is yeah one way that i do that, it that's uh, the funny thing about photoshop is there's 80 ways to do everything in photoshop <laughs> <laughs> yes. so so for me i'm always looking for a lot of um control because i might be using um uh three frames for one drawing or i might be using one frame for one drawing and so having uh, better control over my onion skinning is makes things a little easier for me. Uh, what I also like to do 
is use actions. So I'll make actions to make new frames or to trim the playhead, things that are useful for. Uh, oh, can you walk us through one of your favorite actions? Because now we're talking about automation. This gets both me yeah. and Rob very excited. <laughs> yeah, <I'm, laughs> I might be moving a little quickly, but um, yeah. So so while there there is a lot of third party plugins that will accomplish this a, a lot of the stuff for you, you can. What I prefer to do is uh, make my own actions. Um, so say I want to make a new frame instead of going through what I had done earlier, which was duplicating the frame and making it 30% and all that jazz. I can just press F1 and it will make a new frame for me. And um, yeah. Hmm. So, so I already have stuff set up that does all of that. And I just press hotkeys to do that. Um, I've recently updated my Photoshop, so it doesn't have all of my actions, my normal actions, but, um, uh. but yeah, but that's basically how you do it. There's, there's a lot of tutorials online too. Um, oh. yeah, certainly actually, um, a, any, well, um, curious, what, what were some of, what was another interesting thing from your, from your workshop that you were like, well, um, I imagine a lot of people say, I'm, I'm really bummed. I missed a two calf last year. And, and uh, <laughs> like for, so I, I can't draw from experience having, you know, having been there um, uh, last year, but if you uh, like, what, what was the question or something that, uh, that the audience um, would, would jump on where, you know, okay, Photoshop as an animation tool, that's, that's kind of a, maybe a surprise for some folks, but like maybe, you know, a huge enabling thing. Um, where where did uh, what was there? Was there any other tidbits there that uh, um, be, you know? Because you know, online tutorials there's there's a there's an abundance, but like you're right there and live, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what um, any kind of uh, like. Any kind of question that sort of made me think yeah. about it too. Well, a question or thing that, yeah, a thing that um, that you were like, you tuning in and seeing like, okay, people are, you know, their their eyes get shot wide open for with with a particular well, <laughs> an example you shared, and then I don't know, like what, uh, what, I, I yeah, a, a tidbit from from what you taught. I'm I'm really curious about. Um, like, so <laughs> I, I feel like I, I kind of yeah, over prepared right. a little bit because for, for the A2 cap thing, cause I was like going to go into animation principles Ooh. and like, <laughs> but, um, uh, so folks tended to, there were, I mean, there were a lot of different people with different skill levels and, um, mm -hmm. and some people were coming at it, um, wanting to to make like characters or just do little doodles. Um, I mean, there wasn't anything that I, I don't recall anything that was really, um, that was, that seemed, that seemed to, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, that's interesting too, as far as what, you know, the, the variety of the audience, uh, the different skill levels and whatnot. And it sounds mm -hmm. like, um, uh, so as a, um, as a presenter, <laughs> um, you, you didn't, you know, maybe not knowing what the face you had tons of, um, extra material in your, um, in tow, right. Ready to <laughs> yeah. like, like what, what was something in your, in your extra material that you were like hoping, hoping to, to get to like the maybe. Uh, well, I was, I was hoping to, to just kind of get through the the sort of basics of the program and then have people see their own art sort of come to life which is personally mm -hmm. my favorite part of animation um and and some and some folks were able to do that and i and i and i hope they that they were really inspired by that <laughs> i guess i don't know for sure i can't speak for them but um but yeah i mean it was it was fun for me just to sort of uh, walk through the program and and give give people this new tool of of making their own art. 
Um, but cool. yeah, I guess I can't really say. Oh, I, I think you, I, yeah, I think that makes sense. I think you did like, uh, <laughs> because yeah, everyone's at a different place. Right. And, yeah. uh, you're in a, in this, in the position of, uh, being this, um, uh, this, uh, unif facilitating, um, unifier of like, well, we're all here. We have some general curiosity, but like maybe for instance, maybe if there's uh, gatherings of, uh, I'm making this up by the way, this isn't me going off a little bit, but like, um, <laughs> gatherings of people who have seen the Conan musical lots of times <laughs> versus the first time. Right. And, uh, you know, are there special, you know, hats to wear or dishes to prepare or what have you? Um, in, in tradition of Conan the musical, I don't really know. I'm totally new to it. Right. But like maybe Jersey would know and then whatever. And so people show up bringing what their, what their own experience is. Uh, and, and I mean, that's, I don't know, like that, that can be part of, um, you know, if, 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 if um, part of the adventure if it's facilitating, I guess. Um, but uh, anyway, so just, yeah, going through, um, explaining that, uh, uh, that question, I'm really curious too. Um, let's see what, um, cause this, this demo was really cool. Is there, um, what would you do as far as, uh, like video game projects where someone's like, yeah, I need a Sprite to, um, to have a, you know, maybe do some running, maybe do some jumping. Right. Mm -hmm. And I want to put that in a, in a video game. Um, yeah, I guess. So in, in my experience, um, it, it sort of depends on what kind of video game you're working with. Like you could definitely use Photoshop to make the sprites that you're interested in making for a video game. Um, and Photoshop has a lot of great, uh, sprite exporting options and, and, and features, which is awesome. Um, but what, what I've been doing lately is actually working with, um, uh, cause we use unity a lot at fable vision, uh, for our game engine. So, um, so Makes we sense. are preparing animation for that. Uh, and we do use Photoshop a lot. What we end up doing though, is exporting stuff out of Photoshop and into a program called spine, which then, um, lets us animate it in a way that's sort of similar to um, After Effects puppet animation, if that makes sense uh, to anyone out there. But it it then uh, speaks really, Spine speaks really well with Unity, and so you can do a lot of things through Spine animation that you can't necessarily do with your regular old sprites. So. Um, no, that's... that's um... That's that's pretty cool. So let's let's see if there's um, like okay, I, I don't want to. I, I have a I have a selfish angle of curiosity here too. But like, <laughs> I was gonna I, say you're, he, he's asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm asking for me. <laughs> but okay, what about um? So when you are um, this is almost an uh maybe starting to get into the uh, the next section perhaps, but um. Uh, like I'm really curious about uh, like how do you how do you tackle those those different projects and um, uh, like which which um, so which how, like are there other steps you you have that are um, like the part of the conceptual creative process where like before you go into something concrete with uh, um, with demoing or is, or is, um, I don't know, is Photoshop such a, like a useful sketch pad where there isn't a separation of those, uh, of those stages compared to like your, co compared to like a comic, like the stages you go through for, and right. maybe right. using different media for that. Uh, right. Um, so uh, as an animator, I don't typically do a lot of concepting or designing. So, uh, mm. On, but for my own work, uh, I do kind of go through the, the those steps. Um, so while in a larger setting, uh, in a larger studio setting, I wouldn't necessarily, but in my own work, I do. So 
what typically happens is you start out with your idea and you either thumbnail out what you want. And, and that I, I think is very closely related to uh, comics and those turn into what's called storyboards, which people are probably familiar with. Um, and that's uh, the same kind of uh, method that you would approach for film where you're sort of setting up your shots and uh, your camera angles. And that's, I mean, and, and while that's really important for film, it's actually even more important for animation, particularly 2D animation, because your backgrounds will really depend on your camera angles <laughs> and you cannot repaint your background. <laughs> so you gotta get it right. Um, so storyboarding phase actually is very, very important. And once you're finished with that, you go into um, um, an animatic phase, which is either during is either a part of the storyboarding phase or 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 not if you're doing it a little more traditionally. But in this digital age, storyboards are created digital. And so that makes it really easy to um, to then kind of animate the storyboard to see how things are kind of are, are going to move through the scene and that's what's called an animatic and so uh with an animatic then you just the storyboard artist will hand over that animatic to the animator and the animator can then start plugging in characters from like a library so so that that would be the typical setup for something like a television animation um, so if you're using a program like Flash or Toon Boom, where it's set up for character libraries, for characters that you're reusing a lot, and then you sort of plug those in on top of your animatics and uh, get to animating almost immediately. So, um, That's an awesome overview. Uh, and it, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of, it's a lot of, that's a lot of context, like in a, in a small, in a, concise package so um what um and this is a in, a in a weakness on my part is is being being on on, on the projects that are helping me generate these questions i am not on, i'm not on a big team right mm. and uh oh that makes a ton of sense that that um there's a lot of dividing and conquering of this work is one of yes one of because yeah. uh animation is almost so. always a, a team project very yeah and uh, yet, okay, I have to say, I have some appreciation of this too, where it's uh, because running into pain points of not being on a big team, right? Mm -hmm. and, and thinking like, well, geez, I don't really have the skills for all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, what, um, what, what, what are you, what are you like, Rob, when you say I don't have the skills for all the skills for this stuff, what skill no. in particular is standing out or are any standing oh. out? Like, oh, that would be hard for me to do. Lots and lots. Right. And it sounds it sounds even it sounds terrible. Even like I hear the phrase come out of my I don't have the skills for all this stuff. I I feel like anyone in an independent effort, um, like we've talked about lots, you you if you're comfortable accepting that uh, you've got to wear a lot of hats. Um, I'm not claiming I wear any of the hats and to the you know, extent of a specialist at, right. This is just, it's like, it's like scratching and surviving, be, you know, figuring stuff out as, as I go. Like, um, in the last year I've switched from game developing, uh, mostly in, in JavaScript with, um, building my own stuff off of, uh, phaser JS as an engine and seeing that the unity ecosystem is so, um, vibrant and healthy and takes away a lot of pain points. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that's a strong ecosystem. And it's pretty quick after that where all of a sudden like um, in, okay, so animation in my, in my past games um, it has been procedural, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, Guitar Fretter is especially one of those things where I have um, in, in, in the frames as the, as the game updates and goes through its loop, it's saying like, well, there's a creature falling down the screen and it's doing a wobble and it's just going wobble, wobble down the screen and it's breathing. It's quite, you know, like a little bit. And those two things are cheap and easy. And I can tweak one algorithm or a couple algorithms and get mileage and be like, yeah, you know, it kind of looks alive. It doesn't look <laughs> fancy. It doesn't look, you know, triple A, right? But mm -hmm. anyway, so here I am. I go from that and to, to this desire of like, this has been a painful point for years where I'm like, okay, I want to do better in the animation. And um, yeah. So, but, but really falling short, seeing like the desire to do better 
is a big chasm sometimes to try to, to try to jump across across where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's fun to be able to see um, how it could be better, but then to act on that is um, okay. So following up on that, following up on that, I'm wondering, Hannah, I'm totally yeah. putting you on the spot here, but are there any little tiny cheats? Like, Oh, if you just do this one little thing, it looks 10% more alive. Like for instance, like one of the things I tell my students is like, I forget the fancy art term for it, but it's when you turn a character's shoulders in opposition to the waist. Uh, Zach would know oh, if it, it, uh, or no. yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's like something like that, but like basically just doing that in a pose makes it like 15% more alive. Even if the rest of the anatomy is a little wonky, it just feels <laughs> a little bit better. You know, yeah. I wonder if there's anything in animation that you've employed repeatedly to be like, okay, it's a cheap little trick, but if you do this, it looks like it's moving around a little bit more when you so, do it. Yeah, yeah, totally. There is. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say just about everything about animation is cheap little tricks. You, <laughs> It's like a series of tricks that you're orchestrating together to make this fake dead uh, 2D thing alive. Right? <laughs> that it's sounds morbid. <laughs> it's all alive. <laughs> but um, but we we train ourselves to be good at like no because that's it's a really important thing to to think about because a lot of a lot of young animators are, are really worried about making something right and making it um, uh, absolutely perfect and and animation looks so much better when it's exaggerated right when it's not perfect when it's not real. So there's a lot of tricks. In fact, all, like most of it, I think like 99% of animation is tricks. And those tricks are called the principles of animation. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, can you share yes. just like one little one? Like a, 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 a one that we could start using today if, yes. if we so, tried it. Yes, so one that has always uh, really helped me and that might just be a personal thing. Like I've just personally had problems with this, but one thing that really when I got it, it like animation clicked better for me was understanding the importance of arcs in motion. So an example would be if, if you are going to wave, if you're going to move your hand from here to here, just a simple little, there's a very slight arc, just a little bitty subtle arc. And if it's perfectly straight, that looks, that feel like, my shoulder hurts when you do like it's not even natural it's not real it's not natural that's what robots do like if you want it to feel convincing see we're lying we're make we're making this fake movement uh you have to add things such as arcs arcs really help sell it mm. so even when they're walking so like when you're doing a walk cycle instead of having it just be legs yes. moving and the characters just like moving uh horizontally across the plane but putting like a a bounce in there like mm-hmm. each step well, is its that, own arc uh yes and and that applies to to everything jersey like you you wouldn't expect it but it applies to every like it applies to the knees it applies to the heel it applies to the t- end of the foot there's arcs all over the place and uh i guess a good example of that where you maybe wouldn't expect it is if you're doing a head turn right i'm just turning my head yeah. drawing a head turn if you add an arc like it goes down and back up it looks way better <laughs> or just a little, uh, little over the shit. like you don't necessarily do that in real life but it certainly looks better when you do it in animation so something i i'm always talking with my students about is trying to create a sense of imbalance in the poses and mm. that, that i'm reminded of that as you say that i wonder if there's like something related between these two things in the sense that when you put the arc of your head as you turn, like putting, like there's the head is at imbalance. Whereas if I turn the head like this, like side to side in a straight line, that's still in ba- that's still in horizontal balance. But creating like a sense of vertical and horizontal imbalance mm-hmm. tends to feel more fluid for some reason. I I don't have the uh, art education pedigree that some of my peers have, but I suspect it has something to do with the fact that all movement is is a sense of uh, stabilized in balance right yeah yeah and i that i think probably has more to do with making uh, a movement that's believable 
than necessarily arcs, but arcs certainly play off of that idea. Um, That's great. So, so one thing that another principle that sort of that I think maybe uh, uses that I the idea of imbalance more is uh, anticipation, which is another one that is an extremely useful uh, uh, animation trick slash principle. And, and basically that's if you move, if you are gonna wave your hand, we'll use that example again, you, your hand isn't, you, so say in animation, what we, what we tend to do when we start out is we draw, if we're gonna draw a hand wave, we do this drawing and then this drawing, and those are your key poses. And then you make the drawings in between those as you animate so that you know where you're drawing. You don't, you don't necessarily draw one frame after the other. Um, so, right. so you key it out, you make your key poses here and here, and then you draw the in-betweens. But what you forget is that there's actually a movement right before you start that wave of anticipation where the hand actually goes in the opposite direction just a little bit because your, your arm is anticipating the movement and then it goes. So you're sort of doing a uh, like that. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. That's... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. It it makes uh makes so much sense. It, it's almost it um there's a lot more uh there's a lot more energy and it reminds me of uh like physics simulation. Um so much of animation is physics. I can't even tell you. It's like it's all physics, really. Like you're trying to convince people that this thing exists and so you have to apply physics to it and uh, well base and I have like a basic understanding of how physics works. That's, that's, that's where I, th I think a lot of uh, like animation and game development can be like really strong, you know, collaborators, you know, yes. like that's seems. Yeah. And I, I, and a little, yeah, that's where I guess I, you, you can stumble onto the right answer here and there. Right. <laughs> so like uh just you know a little bit of cheating help me out but then uh not knowing a little you know, like anyway that that was that's super helpful um, <laughs> well there it, i feel like the idea of tying uh physics and and code like sort of cuz i'm thinking of uh instances in animation where there's automatic phys uh, physics applied to your to your animation rig Mm -hmm. So, so, and that's where you see that more is when you're doing puppet like animation, either in 2D or this, I think is more, it happens more often in 3D animation where you have a, a three dimensional uh, character who's rigged and then you can apply automatic sort of physics or coding to the, to, to the rig. So if you if you place the if you move the foot up, it will automatically move the knee and the hip and everything with it. That sort of thing. And that's where I forget the difference is like is there that's like inverse kinematics versus forward kinematics. <laughs> yeah. So forward kinematics. Uh, now we're getting into areas I'm not as familiar with, but I believe from the long long time ago when I was in school and I was <laughs> learning this stuff. Um, but forward kinematics is is sort of your regular puppet thing where you've got your hinges and you're animating them mm -hmm. one by one, and then inverse kinematics is where you just you have you have that rig you have those joints, mm -hmm. but then you have a controller on the end which will actually affect all of them if you move the controller. It's really helpful for things like feet because feet need to always impact on the ground, and so if you set that controller like to be on the ground then when you move it up and down it's always connecting to that ground plane well it sounds like we're heading into uh ten thousand feet up and i want to keep on this tack of because the, the first question on my list is like comparing and contrasting I'll, I'll give this to you now hannah so you can think about it while we do our break sure. uh comparing and contrasting animating for straight narrative versus animating for games like mm -hmm. what are the different kinds of practices and frictions and, uh, you know, sort of uh, problem solving that one does differently in those two arenas. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna take a minute and 30 seconds to thank some people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. 
Yes, patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? Well, it's like a Kickstarter, but for uh, ongoing projects. So it's your way to give us a monthly upvote. Say, hey, I believe in you guys. I believe in the, the stuff that you do and the way that you think. And here's a dollar a month or whatever you can afford. Uh, patreon.com slash lean into art. We want to thank five people who have been doing just that. First up, Nate Marcel. Thank you, Nate, for believing in the show. And Metal Witch Sketchbook Project. This must be a new one. Uh, I have not... I have not uh, See this person uh, in the in the feed before, Rob. That's awesome. Uh, thank you, Metal Witch Sketchbook Project, for supporting the show. Uh, Angela Mitchell. You can find Angela Mitchell on Twitter at Angie Makes Stuff. And then we got Cameron Callahan, longtime supporter of the show. Thank you, Cameron. You can find Cameron's work, uh, Cam, Cam Makes Comics, too, at Cam Callahan on Twitter. And finally, Catherine Sugru, another longtime supporter. You can find Catherine on Twitter at K-A-T-S-O-O-G-R-O-O. -O -O. That's how we know how to pronounce her last name. And you can join them at patreon.com slash lean into art where you'll find all the shows that we produce as well as the extra leans, the shows we record in between the shows where Rob and I riff on a topic and then that post becomes an open mic post which is available only to Patreon supporters. And we thank everybody who has been supporting us there one last time, patreon.com slash lean into art. Mm -hmm. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you so much. Okay, are we ready for the bridge music to the next section? Yes. <laughs> Here <it> comes. Cross <laughs> your enemies. <laughs> See them driven <laughs> before you. <laughs> and hear the lamentation of the women. <laughs> hear the lamentation of the women. <laughs> 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 <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, the, we did a road trip last summer, uh, the comics caravan. <laughs> And Zach and Hannah were singing that in the back seat of the car for I don't know how long. Calm. Oh. <laughs> it was so much fun. I don't know how many times you guys broke me with that one. Uh, all right. So continuing on, we're in, now like in the abstract part of the show where we talk about like you know philosophy, uh, theory, um, uh, the, the 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 why questions about why we do what we do. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious: Are there any big differences, Hannah, in the problem solving that you do, doing like that short that we watched at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, versus doing pieces for games, whether it's like cycles for characters, the way they react in the environment, or even if you're doing like like cutscenes and things like that? I don't know if you've done that, but uh, I have not yet done cutscenes for games, but. Um... I have done both the narrative animation and game animation, and they are very different. Um, I mean, it to me, animation's animation. I'm just doing my thing. But as far as like the 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 process, like the whole uh, workflow of everybody involved, um, it's very very different. Um, so for for narrative. It, it happens very much like I had explained before, where you have storyboards, and then uh, that moves on to uh, your your animator, and then that moves on to your editor. Like, so, and that's sort of the very traditional sort of animation flow. Um, but for games, um, it's you have a list of things right like i'm i'm in charge i'm the character animator so i'm animating characters and that includes it's, say it's a say it's a side scrolling platformer like mario um i would have the mario design like the character design and then i would need to make him idle make him walk make him jump make him uh squat I'm trying to remember all the things Mario does. Uh, run, fireball. Right, fireball. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have like a list of things that I animate him doing in place, essentially. And then I give that to the developer or the coder and they plug that into the game. So it's it's very different. Um, much, I'm much more removed from, from the narrative of a game, if there is even a narrative in the game, than I am from... What kind of information do you get in terms of like, do you get any information in terms of like, well, because something else I teach in my comics classes is I talk about how in like the difference in the way a character behaves can tell you a lot about them. And if you stop playing Sonic for long enough, what does he do? He crosses his arms and taps his foot and he's like, come on, let's, let's play. Whereas Mario, in, at least in Mario 64, like he takes a nap 
right? And I'm like, well, that tells you a lot about the inner life of these two characters in the way they react to idle activity, right? Yeah. So are you getting information like that when you're designing these characters? Um, not necessarily. Uh, so I love dogs, like my favorite game ever. Song Hedgehog 2, mind you, too. Uh, <laughs> but, and I love stuff like that where you've got those little like character tidbits in there. But as an animator, um, if pu doing purely animation, uh, I don't, I don't end up doing a lot of the, um, uh, the character building that's usually, or, or the, the sort of backstory or, or, or even creating the list of things <laughs> that I end up, uh, being charged with later. Uh, so like, I don't know what that would be, uh, an idle prompt animation or something. I'm not sure what that'd be called, but, um, but that would just be added to my list, say. Um, but again, okay. that's that's the nature of a studio environment. If I were an independent game uh, person and I was uh, doing it all myself, which I, I that I'm like getting anxious just thinking about that. <laughs> like, oh my god, um, I don't know how you do it, Rob. Oh my gosh, uh, but uh, yeah, barely. <laughs> Yeah, that's ex almost exaggerating to say I do it. It's like once every three years, <laughs> and uh, it's almost exaggerating. Oh, that's a great line. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's yeah. But but okay. So it's uh, I love that the the reality check and checking in on, on like the the different angles on like okay, um, the uh the context of independent where you know the different hats and st versus studio um but uh it's and it's not a versus it's 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 more of um just different worlds and um what um uh and let's see there so like there's it's not what i'm hearing is that there's a lot of the um the mechanics in both situations it's just that maybe the mechanics are um in, in uh traditional animation have a um uh a uh, it's like a longer you have a maybe there's so there's a longer connection to the to the resulting product right or or i don't know if i'm phrasing that right versus uh a discrete um you know um uh, checklist kind of thing versus with the uh, with with, yeah. with the game, right? Yeah. Um. Does that like what what is that? Um. Is that a different like so when you when you um completed at one of those scenarios? Um. What's the what like is your your successful like a feedback loop for um like like what are you looking for as far as um correctness and um like what how are you mm, i don't know like what what are what's your what's your criteria in those different situations for um <laughs> uh, you, like if any part of that sound sound exciting or because <laughs> I get it when when you're part of a big when you're part of a big team like yeah. you're, you're team like so like you know, like the the team wins you win and that that's what everyone is is in for right so I don't want to uh, confuse that but I'm like is there another aspect of um of those um of those scenarios that. I don't know, like if, if you look, if you look at, um, the, like either, either product, um, which is, uh, let's see. Cause it's, it's not like, I, I'm not trying to ask the question of like, what do you prefer, you know, or whatever. It's just, <laughs> unless that, unless that sounds, you know, well, there are pros, exciting. pros and cons to either one. Right. Okay. Like if I'm working on my own game and I'm doing my own thing, then I get to have more say over the characters or the story. And that's something that I can be more of a part of, which as an artist is, is always enjoyable, right? I get, I love, I mean, I do this because I love telling stories. And so if I, if I'm more involved in the story, then I feel um, way better about it. But that also comes with a lot more responsibility, right? I don't have a team to lean on when 
my code breaks and I have no idea how to fix it. You know, I, I can get, I can use the little rubber duck uh, uh, guy that <laughs> I've been told developers sometimes use to talk to, to work out their code thing. Um, but I, I, I don't like, I, I, maybe I've, I've like trained myself to, to prefer a team because I've been working with teams for so long as an animator. Um, but, but I do really like that environment where if anything happens, I have other people to lean on that can help me figure out how to fix things or how to finish things on time. Or cause there's always, uh, uh, when you're working on a studio, there's always very strict deadlines and, um, you know, you might be working with clients. So there's an added responsibility there. Um, what, what I'm hearing in there is something that I think is applicable to anybody who's, even if you don't work with a team, is just having some kind of uh, brain trust to, to go to. Yeah. You know, it's like there, there was a, a scene in uh, the book that Ann and I have coming out in June called Rockets, where we were really stuck on the way the characters were talking in the scene. We could not figure it out. And I just showed it to Dan Mishkin. He was like, oh, just have this character say this, have this character say that. And I was like, it just fixed everything. Everything just like cascaded <laughs> down. It was like, the scene is crystal clear. It is perfect now. And I turned and was like, how did you do that? You know, he's like, well, I'm not in it. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, you, you, right. you're up to your neck in it right now. And yeah, it's like, I can see from the outside. So anyway, yes, having anybody you can turn to, to get a quick, reality check on things I can imagine would help a lot. But if I could it, it build on your question, Rob, if I may interpret it slightly, um, what does successful sprite animation look like to you? Are there any criteria that you say like, ah, I nailed this one? Are there any <laughs> things that you look for in that? Um, for me- Or is it just like the client liked it? <laughs> yeah, well, so so the successful thing for me is if I uh, if I laugh out loud at my own animation, that if it if it makes me go ah, <laughs> then I feel like I've accomplished something because that's what I like to do. I like to make myself laugh, and my <laughs> my coworkers who sit next to me probably think I'm a crazy person, but I <laughs> laughing to myself. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> but I have fun. So, <laughs> so yes, so there's that, but also it's just, you know, making something that you're proud of that I think any artist is uh, going to use as a criteria for the work. So it's, it's, it's more of a, uh, it's a heuristic thing where it's like, oh, I know it when I see it and I, it, I got the chuckle. It's not like, there's not like this, this <laughs> philosophical checklist of like a proper sprite <laughs> has these five features or anything like yes. that. Well, I mean, okay. I guess I could be all um, responsible and say, oh, it's the one that uses the least amount of data and uh, fits in, uh, completely in the uh, 1024 by 1024 sprite uh, thing and does not go outside and you only have one, you don't have to deal with any more, you know. <laughs> Those are all great. And yeah, I, I guess my developer would really like it for me to not break those rules, but sometimes you just need something goofy to happen and it requires an extra sprite game <laughs> Ann and i were playing the um the original ninja turtles arcade game the one where you can be all four turtles on the screen at once yeah. and basically you just go sideways and just beat up foot soldiers forever and ever <laughs> yeah uh and like just there was this one moment that caught us off guard and like it had been a long time since we played the game and it, it just delighted us that like when they find the pizza, like the, the pizza power up to give them strength so they can keep fighting. Uh, Michelangelo stops and looks at the screen, and holds up a slice of pizza, and says, "Pizza time!" You know? <laughs> it's yeah. the dumbest little thing, but like those kind of moments, like really grabs yes. at least yes. did for me. Yes. And those yeah. are typically the things that make me chuckle is when I'm is when I'm able to like put a little thing in there. Like maybe it's as simple as a character has a big nose, and I make their nose floppy when it wasn't really supposed to be but it makes me laugh so i do it um you know stuff like that and then when i show it to someone I'm like oh i didn't even think about that that's funny You're like yeah it is <laughs> you're right it is <laughs> uh 
we're closing in. I think we might be closing on final thought pretty soon, Rob. Is there anything else that we didn't cover? Uh, um, uh, let's see. No, this is, um, this is, this has been awesome. I, I am, um, you know, I, I, I have lots of questions because, you know, I, but, um, uh, you know, I, you know, I, this is, um, this is a big topic, right? Um, yeah. Clear, you know, I've, you know, I, in like, I, I'm sometimes I'm, I hang lampshades on stuff. I'm captain obvious. It's one of my jobs on the show and in life. It's an um, important office. <laughs> and, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is fun. Um, so let's, um, let, let's see. What, what were you thinking as far as final thought? Um, I, okay. So Hannah and I actually had, uh, a, a kind of conversation earlier this week in oh, which, oh boy. Hannah said to me, push the design, push the design. And I, I think I intuitively know what that means, but I'm wondering if we could try to define that. Like, what does it mean to push a design in visual communication and try? And I think that this will actually be, I suspect it will be useful to me and it'll be useful to Rob with his game design, uh, thinking about what pushing the design means. Um, <laughs> does that sound okay, Hannah? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So it, we're going to take one more break, about a minute and 30 seconds or so, and uh, we will talk about what that means. Uh, but before we do that, we got to thank some other people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be us. Uh, we make comics and games, and we would like to take this moment to talk to, talk with you about some of those things. Um, first one is Science Comics Rockets, which comes out in June, as I mentioned a little while ago. What is Science Comics Rockets? Well, it's a, a part of a series called the Science Comics Series from First Second. And uh, this book that I'm the one that I worked on with my wife Anne is about the history and science of rockets as told by grumpy animals. So we found all these different <laughs> stories of animals in rocket history, and we uh, have the animal hosts explore the physics of rockets, how do what makes rockets go, and what was the development of rockets starting out in like first century China to now, and how how were they used in different ways? Like there's a chapter on rockets and entertainment, rockets and warfare, rockets and exploration. So you can start with whatever part of history is most interesting to you. And in each chapter, you will learn a new little thing about how rockets fly, position themselves, guide themselves, and how different kinds of fuel create different kinds of thrust. And so that affects the design and how much of the design of the rocket has to be actual uh, material weight for the casing versus how much of the weight has to be fuel. And then there's this optimal mass index. And it's all really funny, too. It's full of terrific jokes so that's uh, available for pre-order on amazon now rob you make a game i do it is uh it you know it's called this panda needs you and um i'll try to pull it up and play it oh while you talk about okay it. i'll be i'll be fast about it this time so no. um th this panda is um you know that it it's it's you know this character that is walking through a a, 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 pl a bamboo forest and uh, encounters block puzzles, and it's your job to help the panda um, fix things because you know darn it, a cloud keeps coming along every level, knocks all the blocks over, and uh, it's your job to help the panda put things put things right. Um, they the puzzles start out very easy and are it's really meant for like an, an all age or even a very younger audience with learning pattern matching and um and um uh hand coordination with uh touch screens it works actually on lots of kinds of platforms it works on um uh, you know iphone ipad uh android phones and tablets and uh that's it's on uh, desktops as well so um you can learn more about it at this-panda.com and search for it in your favorite app stores uh, for um, for iOS, Android, and on desktop, you'll have to see it in um, the itch.io um, market. And if you have purchased it, a great thing you could do uh, would be to give it a rating on whatever platform on which you purchased it. Purchased it that'll help more people discover the game as well. But let's suppose you know it's all well and good that you guys make a lot of stuff. We don't care. We like the way you think about stuff. Well, fair enough. We have a place where we put a lot of the products based on the thinking that we do, and that's at leanintoart.com slash workshops, where you can, and it's not loading. I'm hoping that it'll eventually <laughs> load. You can just imagine what it looks like. There it is. Okay, leanintoart.com slash workshops. And uh, you can download 
self-contained videos uh, with workshops that we've led in classrooms for years at a price of your choosing. It could even be free, um, but if you do get something out of it, a great thing you could do is come back and purchase it again. It'd be like getting, giving us a tip. You could even share that uh, new purchase with a friend. Um, if you're watching the video on YouTube right now, a free thing you could do would be giving it a thumbs up or subscribe to the channel if you have not done so yet. Or if you're listening to the show in a podcatcher, uh, you know, tell a friend about it or give the show a five-star rating. That helps more people find the show as well. And we thank everybody who has been doing those things. It means a lot to us. It really does. So many, uh, so many kind, kind thoughts and uh, people spreading the word. And uh, it, it means a lot and it helps. Thank you. Okay, final thought time. All right, pushing the design. This is uh, this sounds super interesting. What um, do you guys? What, was this uh, an unresolved conversation before the show? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of was, but we don't have to go into what, what the details of it was. It's just that we were talking about a character design, mm -hmm. and Hannah said, "Push it, push the design." And I was like, "I think I know what you mean, but I'm wondering if we could define that, like what it means to push it." Sure. Yeah, so, so when I, um, when I said that, I was sort of thinking, um, we had a character that could be more than it was. It could be something else that wasn't really thought about because that's a little bit outside of the normal thinking for a character of that type. So, so when I was uh, suggesting. So like if I were to say big, strong guy. Big, yeah. or, or not even big strong guy, strong guy. I'll say those yeah. two words. This is this yeah. is the muscle of the team. And think about what that invokes in your head, right? Yeah. And so like, what would you say? If, and then, if we were and to... push that. Make that something maybe a little unexpected or or something that you're not normally prone to do. So, so. a big strong guy that likes to wear dresses or <laughs> likes to i don't know um sing operas or tall skinny strong guy right yeah. uh i think of like do you remember the um oh my gosh i can't believe i'm blanking on the name what are those big tough creatures in the popeye comics that are on that that, that island um, alice yeah alice the goon i forget what their their species is called they're like there's like like the goons the goons, that's what I thought it was, but I, I couldn't put my finger on it. Yeah, it's like, right, like, they don't look like the broad-shouldered, blue, like, giant Bluto character, like, this tall beanpole thing with, like, just big hands, right? But they look powerful for some reason. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you're saying push, you're saying look for unexpected things. Yeah, sort of, I guess, uh, maybe a, a better way to say that is just to sort of put yourself outside your normal comfort zone. Um, um or, or yeah in, like in a how? way that you wouldn't expect yourself to do and if you do that you might pleasantly surprise yourself and your audience <laughs> and, well so you might laugh at, at your at your efforts yeah like i do <laughs> <laughs> you're like ah, i'm on the right track yeah uh, all right. Or or maybe I, it's something that makes you feel uh, like, oh, oh, that's actually kind of deep, <laughs> you know, like whatever, whatever strikes your fancy, I think. OK, well, so. So like um, like outside a comfort zone, like I, I mean, so like physically, emotionally, mentally, I could um, like try to do a handstand until I fall. Right, which would be pretty quick, <laughs> you know, like. You could make a game where you had, that's like, I don't know, co-op-ish, where you're trying to do a handstand as long as you can. And maybe um, that's not a kind of game you would normally do, but you're like, you know, I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that. See what that's like. It, it, it means you have to use a lot of physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'm, I think I'm getting your drift. Hmm. Yeah. It, I, I would also hypothesize that doing so means that Rob, a language we use in the show a lot is testing your assumptions, right? Yeah. And 
if you are starting with, well, I want a strong guy. This is going to be the strong guy of the team or whatever. And so I'm going to, okay, I'm going to do my big, broad-shouldered Benjamin J. Grimm, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing type of body type. Uh, and somebody says, push that. Mm -hmm. Challenge that uh, challenge that assumption. Well, I assume that's the body type that we normally go with. That's what they do. Um, oh, this is going to be the grumpy character. So the grumpy character is going to be really pulled in and looked down like this all the time. Well, is that the only way to do grumpy? You know, are there are there unexpected layers you could put on that? Is there an unexpected body language you can give to that character? Is there an unexpected affectation? Um, which I, oh. I would hypothesize, the, the, the hypothesis part is that I wonder if it would help you get to more true characters sometimes because when you're flailing around desperately, you don't have time to hide behind cleverness and, yeah. uh, and propped up notions, right? It's like... Yeah. And, and I would argue, and, and you know what, I think that might be a, a better way to describe that, like, pushing the design is challenging your design, like, testing yourself, like, change it somehow, and then make that work. It's not always comfortable, though. It was not a comfortable conversation that we had. No, it wasn't. But that's the point, Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> You're going out, you're pushing yourself outside your box. It's not going to be comfortable, but you might learn something important. But I might fail, Hannah. <laughs> and then what happens? <laughs> then then we're in a room with failure. Learn something. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is a, um, I, I love that framing. And it's so funny how like in, in some, in some contexts, like a, a, um, a skill in your toolbox, is clear and obvious it's salient where you're like this i'm going to use because of course it's you know design is an assumption except when i'm you're drowning under a bunch of other tasks and you know um then you're just trying to survive right but if you if and pushing the design is something that that's a little beyond surviving it's it's like you know you could do you could do better if um uh, um, if you're willing to dig past those those assumed symbols, and um, uh, and test your ideas, why? Like, so why did you why did you say big? Why did you say? And that's that's like what my it, one of the hats I wear as a user experience designer is to help myself and others, you know, unbox this stuff. And it's really hard when it's when it's you individually. So how okay? So how um, your final thought has been super helpful so far. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, Hannah, if there's a, uh, uh, so what, what do you do then to, to push, push those designs? Yeah, 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 totally. Um, what, so, what does it look like? <laughs> well, um, sometimes that is me adding the little things that make me chuckle. Like that's, that's just a little thing. Um, but also sometimes in, in, well, in a team setting, in a studio setting, that's having a, a conversation with somebody who's making the decisions on design or working with a, or, or speaking with a developer about what if we do this instead? What if we tried, um, uh, turning this thing on its head. And how would that? Of course, the developers gonna be like, no, but the, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but might be like, oh well, maybe that's maybe that, that would work. And so, as a team, when you push yourself, you're actually pushing everybody else too, right? Because everybody has to, if something's gonna change, then everybody has to adjust to that. So that's another interesting aspect to pushing the the design or the, the the animation or whatever. So so while I can do my best to try and try and push the animation, try to make it do something that's unexpected, which is is important and you should do that. Um, it's also important to like sort of push the team a little bit like, hey, what if we tried that? And not be afraid of making those suggestions. Mm. So as a team of one, Rob, who has very limited resources, I would say that was a very impish suggestion to be impish to yourself and <laughs> damn the consequences, right? Because it might, it might be better. Yeah, well, that's why it takes so dang long. And, and uh, yeah. that's, that's why we, you know, we interview people like, like Hannah. And uh, 
Um, cause I mean, honestly, we, we, you, you were on our team for this episode, right? And we got to pick your brain. <laughs> yeah. And, um, that was, uh, Im immensely beneficial, if not, you know, uh, mm. damning of my timeline. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm joking. <laughs> um, Hannah, where can people find more of your stuff? Where was, where's the one place you wish people who enjoyed this discussion would go right now to, uh, um, you can find me on Twitter at Cyrilda, Instagram at Cyrilda, or my website, Cyrilda.com. Oh, easy enough. Yeah. Uh, we'll link to all those in the show notes. We should also mention, we neglected to mention that Hannah was on the Galaxy of Super Adventure podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one of the skit episodes uh, with me and, uh, I think it was just me, you, and Zach in that one, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <gasps> So now that'll help people track track it down. I don't I don't know if you were credited in it, but you play a, a very interesting character in that one, and that's at comicsagreat.com slash gosa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's yeah. one of my favorite ones. Everyone should listen to it. It's great. It is. It's a pretty fun it's, one. Um, and it's not just my favorite because I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> no it's one of the short skit ones where the, it's all just it's just radio play and it's just a situation that yeah. zach came up with zach giolongo <laughs> who plays and rankin the, so that's why and, it's awesome and, and there's rankin right behind you one of the characters from the galaxy of super adventure podcast right next to uh, naked bert why is bert naked <laughs> 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 I yeah, this is I can't wait. I gotta re-listen to the uh, Galaxy of Super Venture. Um, it, uh, it's yeah. So that that's a that's an exciting. Uh, we'll have the link in the show notes to that. Or you made it. You made it sound like an Easter egg. Yeah. Or, well, I'll put I'll put a link to the feed, and people can go back and listen to because there's there's a handful of episodes there full of a lot of comedy, and it, it's basically it's like take lean into art and sandwich it between two radio plays where that are based on the topic that we talk about. So, a bunch of art friends talking about their thinking and philosophy around art but then like all of a sudden space monsters might come into the room and we gotta have to start fighting them <laughs> yeah so. oh i love galaxy of super mm -hmm. it's pretty fun yeah, um I, sh I should also say at the very end if you enjoyed what we were talking about today and you know talking about animating in photoshop if i'm not mistaken rob and hannah may very well be at the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival this summer to uh, lead true. more workshops and events there, which is a free event at the Ann Arbor District Library, June 16th and 17th, a2caf.com. We'll be making more noise about that in the coming weeks. But uh, very excited to see you both again. Yeah. I, I know. Yeah, I me too. Wait. I mean, yeah, no, no surprise. My ticket's already there. I just don't know what <laughs> workshop I'm teaching yet. So, um, Well, right. Thank you, Hannah. This was this was fun. Rob, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. It's great to to um, to uh, meet you and learn so much from you on the show. Yeah, this was super fun. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Uh, this show is recorded every Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern time, 9 p.m. Central. And then we stream it live on YouTube at uh, leanintoart.com slash live. But then it's archived as a podcast at patreon.com slash leanintoart. And thanks, everybody, for downloading, watching, and listening. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of LeanIntoArt.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at LeanIntoArt.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user LeanIntoArt. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to shut off the stream. Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you, guys. This was really